Psalm 116, beginning in verse 1. I love the Lord because he heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And would you pray with me? Father, even as we have heard your word read, we pray that you would work on us, your people. Father, we pray that you would guide us by your word and your Holy Spirit, that, Father, in your light we may see light. In your truth we would find freedom. And in your will, we would discover peace through Christ Jesus, our Lord. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Why do you love? Why do you love? That's a a question that we don't ask much in this current cultural moment. It's an assumption. Well, I love because I love. I, I love who I love because it's who I love. I love why I love because, well, there isn't a reason. I just do. I can fall into love and I can fall out of love. And there's no real reason for it. I might attribute some things, some maybe physical attributes, maybe some ways that I'm being served, maybe some ways that it makes me uh, feel and some endorphin rush that it gives me. But the question remains, why do you love? It takes, um, it, it doesn't take actually, much digging to see in our sinful nature many other ways uh, and to answer this question that are very irrelevant. Ways that we would produce in ourselves that that says, um, I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do. In very significant ways, the prevailing notion that we live in, the air that we breathe as we go about our day-to-day labors, our works in, in our own families, in our neighborhoods, the prevailing notion is that There's no room to even ask that question. It's just something that needs to be accepted because I say so. I love because I love. Don't question me on it. Don't ask me why. Just go along with what I think. Now, in this mindset, you're essentially making a law unto yourselves. 
This is what scripture says. There's nothing new under the sun. We go our own way. We go astray. We do what's right in our own eyes. But this, this really, this is an agnostic view of love, meaning I don't really know that there really is a reason for love. I just do what I do. This, that's very foreign to the scriptures. Throughout all of the scriptures, the reason for love is rooted in God himself. We read that I love God, we love God, because he first loved us. It starts with God himself. God loved the Israelites. Why? Because they were a great nation? Because they had so much promise? They were just a diamond in the rough. If you saw the Israelites, like God saw the Israelites through the course of history, you would love them too. No, you would spit them out of your mouth because they'd be disgusting. No, God did not love the Israelites because they were lovable. God loved the Israelites because God is faithful, and God is love. And so we, we come and we see this lovable aspect of, of what we should be loving, not because of, of, of the greatness of, of things that we are, but God loves us because of his namesake. You remember, that's even what Moses uh, argued with God about when God was ready to strike down the Israelites and start a new nation through Moses. And Moses said, but God, what about your name? God is loving because of his name. And this is borne out for us in the very words that we read in Psalm 116. And that will be our focus this morning. Um, Now, we need to understand something. I'm going to be speaking to those that are over the age of 25. So if you're under that age approximately, um, then you're going to need to ask somebody older about what I'm talking about here. But Psalm 116 is like a track on an album. Okay? Albums were either in the form of records or more recently a a CD or a a tape. Um, uh, And a certain group would put together an album worth of music because it told kind of a story. And so each track on that album, each uh, song, contributed to kind of a larger idea in some way, maybe more loosely associated and sometimes a little bit more directly, but it had one focus. Now, Psalm 116 has that in in the entirety of the Psalms. Certainly it plays a role within that, but Psalm 116 actually has a more narrowed album, if you will. And that is Psalms 113 to 118. And this is uh, what, what, uh, what has been come to be known as the Egyptian halal. Halal is just the word for praise because there's so many um, praise the lords in these psalms. But the point is, as we approach Psalm 116 this morning, uh, we are coming to a part of the entire story. Now, we're going to be looking at God delivering. And the whole point of these psalms is, is really about God's deliverance. This morning, it's an individual deliverance. But the other psalms in this, this short collection, the smaller uh, selection, uh, really point to God delivering the people. Uh, in Psalm 114, uh, we see how Israel was brought out of Egypt. So these psalms were sung during Passover. It was the, it was the if you will, in, in, in the way that we kind of approach the church calendar year, we only sing Christmas songs during and right before Christmas. Now, these psalms would have been sung all the time, but during Passover, these psalms would have been especially sweet to the Israelites. Because they speak of God delivering his people. So let me, let me ask the question again as we, as we come into this. Why do you love? We're going to see very clearly the psalmist answers this question from a, a personal perspective. Uh, one that he would, would encourage us and call us to join in with him. But why do you love? This this psalm is an expression of that love in happiness and joy. 
because of what God has done, because of how God has rescued him from great trouble. What we observe in this psalm is a testimony. It's witnessing to God at work in the life of even one individual and God's act of grace. So as we come to this passage this morning, uh, we are especially looking that as this psalm was sung during the Passover, as we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper later on in this service, we are mindful of what Christ has done on our behalf. We are mindful of of what Christ has worked on our behalf. Uh, and, And why do we love Christ? This morning, uh, for the the outlines that are in your bulletins, there are two main points. Um, Don't be alarmed, but we will be spending the vast majority of time on the first point. So if it's getting a little bit later and you're feeling a little bit itchy uh, sitting in your pews or seats, we will be spending more time uh, on the first point. The first point is this. The psalmist recounts deliverance. Uh, The psalm is really broken up into two sections. The psalm recounting his deliverance and really uh, what the response is to that deliverance. And again, it's a personal perspective. This is a, uh, an insight into what God has done even in one individual. But what we see In this first section, the first 11 verses or so, what we see is a very distinct, a very blatant distinction distinction between God's character about what God does and man's situation. So God's character, and then we'll look at man's situation in this deliverance recounted. So what are we told here? What does the psalmist reveal? He says, I love the Lord because he has heard my cry. God's character is revealed. This is, this is all focused on what God has done, what God alone can do. And this is not, as a, even though it is a personal experience that the psalmist is sharing, psalm, the psalmist is not just sharing a personal experience. This isn't just something to say, oh, that's nice for him. No, the psalmist is revealing God's very character in how God worked in his own life. So the first thing that we see, that I want us to see as we work through this God's character, is that he is covenant-keeping. The psalmist does not say, I love your covenant, and it's so great that you have made a covenant with your people at Mount Sinai. But look with me, just, just notice how many times in this psalm that the word Lord is used. And remember along with me the significance of this word. Bible translators for us, as, as you very well may know, Bible translators for us uh, into English do lower capitalization any time that the covenantal name of the Lord is used in the Old Testament. It's a signal to us as English readers to say this is the very special name that was given to Israel to call on their God, the one true God to be sure, but the God who had made himself known to Israel. But if you were paying attention while we were reading this, this word Lord is used 16 times in 19 verses. All over this whole psalm, it's dripping with the reality of God making a covenant with his people. That God brought his people up out of Egypt. And he has promised to be their God. And, he, and, and they will be his people. All throughout this psalm, it's a reminder of what God has done, what God alone can do. And the only time, the, the singular time, that the psalmist refers to God not using this covenantal name? He says, our God. 
Do you see how even though this is a this is an individual praise, that the psalmist is calling us to understand the true reality of God's covenantal keeping character with his people. God does not change, brothers and sisters. Christ has made a new covenant in his blood. God is still keeping the covenant with his people. His character has not changed. This very character the psalmist is proclaiming about what he has done is the same character of the God that we have come this morning to worship. He has not and he will not change. Throughout all of time, throughout all of history, he does not and will not change. Um, I, I do not believe that it is in any way coincidence that the Lord Jesus had in the timing of the Passover. We could go in that in a number of ways, of course. But let me remind us what he said in Luke. He said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus, as he's thinking about this, as he's very likely, if he had not already sung this psalm, will be singing this psalm of how God has delivered the psalmist, will be saying to the disciples, I have so longed to eat this supper with you because I know what's coming next and I know what it is going to be accomplishing on your behalf. I know the glory this is going to give my Father in heaven. I know what this is going to do for me to conquer death and to finally offer true eternal life to all those who believe. That is the covenant that God, that's the covenant keeping that God does. That's his character. But we don't just see covenant keeping here. Uh, we see the, the reality of his caring. Uh, that's what the psalmist says. I, I love the Lord because he heard my voice, my pleas for mercy because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. You see what the psalmist is saying? If I can paraphrase it, he's saying God is predisposed to listen with ears of mercy. God cares. It's not just a matter of God caring because it's convenient. Notice the word the psalmist uses here, inclined. Some of your translations say turned. Really, the idea behind this word is extension. Think, think about uh, when, when uh, we hear the story of the Tower of Babel and the, the, the people are building this great tower to get to God and what is... What is most recorded for us in Genesis? God came down to see what the people were building that was so great and mighty, reaching to the heavens. God came down. He extended. He, he came down. Not, not the same word, but the same idea. The psalmist says, God has extended his ear. It, it's not just something that God, that I can demand of God. It's a mercy. It's a grace. God has extended has inclined his ear and heard me with ears of mercy. Meaning that the psalmist knows that God is holy. That the psalmist knows God doesn't need me. I don't fulfill God in some existential sense. God is self-sufficient. But God in his mercy hears me even as I cry out. God cares. But he doesn't just care, he shows compassion. Jump down with me to verse 5. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. God is gracious. Look, look at the words that the psalmist uses here. He's gracious. Meaning that he, he, he gives more than what is, what is deserved. God is righteous, meaning that he, he, he's perfect. But God, again, we see this word, merciful. God is compassionate. He sees and he knows. Uh, 
Now, how do we know that he sees and knows? What, what, is the, what is the evidence that the psalmist would point to to say, well, I know God is merciful. He, he doesn't show what, what's deserved. Here's the proof that the psalmist gives. I read it. Let me read it one more time. The Lord preserves the simple. You could very easily translate this word as fool. In fact, it's the same word that's used throughout the Proverbs to talk about the simple-minded, the fool, the one who is without knowledge, the one who is without wisdom. So what does the psalmist point to? He says, I am simple. I do not have it all figured out. We'll take a minute and uh, look at that just a, just a moment. Hold on to that thought. But God shows compassion. He stoops down. Uh, I, I almost use the word condescend here, but it has such a negative uh, connotation in our, our, our culture, in our, in our way of thinking that I, I didn't end up using it. But God condescends. He brings himself down low to where his creation is. It's not just about the creation. It's not just about bringing himself down to the, low, to the level of his creation. He's bringing himself down to the level of creation that is sinful, that doesn't match his glory, that has gone its own way, that is a wayward child. And what does God do? He shows compassion. That's God's character. The psalmist loves God because he is covenant-keeping, because he is caring, because he is compassionate, but he's also commanding. In verse 8, the psalmist says, For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my foot, my feet from stumbling. So there's, there's a number of changes here. Do you see... The, the dichotomies here, the, the changes that the psalmist is pointing to. Instead of death, he has life. Instead of his tears, his eyes being filled with tears, the tears are wiped away. No more sorrow. Instead of his feet stumbling, which is a metaphor in the Old Testament of, of really just not doing well in life, his feet are set on a clear path without any impediments. Who can do this? The psalmist would say, only God. Only God has command over death. Only God has command over sorrow. Only God has command over the paths of the people. Only God. So that we read in Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. Why? Because the Lord will direct your paths. He will make your paths straight. He will keep your feet from stumbling. Who can do this but our God? Who can do this but the God who made the heavens and the earth? The answer is no one. Why do you love God? Why would you love? Why do you love? Well, here are four reasons from Scripture in God's own character why you would love him. But it's not just about God's character. In fact, we see, as I said, we see this very uh, stark difference between God's character and man's situation. So then let's take a look and consider man's situation for a moment. Man's situation is needy. It's limited. Jump back with me to verse 3 in Psalm 116. We skipped over it, thinking about God's character. But when we go back to Psalm, uh, verse 3, we read what the neediness of the psalmist really is. He says, The snares of death encompassed me. Now, this may very well be a, uh, a threat to his life. He may have thought, I am going to literally die. But the image here really is of any time. Uh, the image here is actually of um, uh, someone who is hunting birds with a net. And so it's ropes that are tied together kind of in a net. That, that's the, that's the, the image of the snares so that you are trapped. You are caught in a rope that you cannot get free of 
the cords of death. It is like someone who has come and surrounded you. I cannot do it. So this very well, as I said, could be a very real threat on his life. It could be somebody that was threatening his life. But it could also be the reality of despair, the reality of sorrow, the reality of feeling like I am being drugged down to the depths of despair and hell itself because of what I'm experiencing in my life, the reality that I am not in control. Brothers and sisters, you feel this, at least in some way, in various ways, but the people of this culture who have no hope, the people of this culture who only have this world, the people who do not have the, the truth of holding on to the sovereign God who reigns, are filled with despair. This world is full of it. This world offers no hope. The greatest hope that this world can afford is all man-made. Whether it's a law, or whether it's a series of laws, or whether it's security in life, the only hope that this world gives is completely man-made. And I don't know if you've ever owned a car or a computer or a toy or a piece of clothing, but I can tell you this much, it doesn't last. And it's not perfect. And it wears out. And it will not fulfill you. So the psalmist cries out, I was needy. This is my situation. This is the situation of every man, woman, and child in this world. We are trapped. But we hear this word again. Mercy. Not necessarily in the word that he uses, but in the action that God takes. The psalmist says, The snares of death encompass me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. The mercy that we hear now is not the mercy that God gives in approaching the person even, but it's the mercy that God grants the psalmist to know his need. If you don't know that you are sick, you don't seek help. If you don't know that you are thirsty, you don't go looking for a drink of water. And so the mercy that God has shown to this psalmist is to say, know your need. Know your need. Now, you and I need to come to this same realization that you haven't figured it all out. That you are, in fact, needy. The, the more that you get to know God through Christ Jesus, the more that you get to know Christ in the Word of God, the more that you see the glories and excellencies of Christ, but the more that you see and know your own need to say, God is so good. I don't match up. How gracious is God? I'm blown away by what he would do. The realization of this need, the realization of this human neediness, uh, sin aside, of just regular old human neediness, should draw us and propel us to see God and to seek him. You know, and we're not alone in this. The, the psalmist experienced it. But you know what? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ experienced the same feeling of neediness. Matthew chapter 26. After they had eaten the supper together and sung a hymn, they went out and Jesus prayed. He brought the disciples and left some, brought three, left them a little bit distance. He, he went on and prayed. And here's what Matthew records for us. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here 
and watch with me. Jesus, who is the very Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. Jesus, in his, in his human nature, knowing what was before him, we read in Hebrews, the joy that was set before him of the cross propelled him forward, but he was not immune and he was not ignorant of the very real feelings of what was before him. Jesus experienced sorrow. He saw the neediness in his own uh, humanity. And so Jesus could say and pray to his Father, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Do you see that Jesus, in the same vein as the psalmist, is crying out to God, is crying out to his Father, not because Jesus lacks anything, he is very God of very God, but because he has the real feelings of humanity and crying out, knowing that it is the Lord who saves, it is God who will raise him from the dead. This is the realization. No, no, no other option. There's no other option here that you can have except to, to pray to God, deliver my soul. Nothing else. You have no other option before you. So man's situation is needy, but it's also limited. Well, real quickly, look with me at verse 6 again. The second half of this, where it says, when I was brought low, he saved me. The psalmist understands I'm limited. I don't know all that's out there. I can get, uh, as, um, as, as, as my mom was wont to say on occasion, may have been about myself, more than likely about my siblings, um, the phrase, I think you're too big for your britches, meaning that you kind of think yourself too much. The psalmist didn't have that problem because he knew his neediness. He knew his limitation in some way, shape, or form, but he saw it not necessarily until after the fact that the Lord brought him low. To say, I am limited. I am not God. I do not know all time and space. I do not know everything. What we don't see clearly, we need to trust God. That's what the psalmist says in verse 10. I believed... Now, it didn't look like it. What was happening was was really there, but I believed, I trusted in the Lord. Even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. Even in my distress, I believed. I am limited. I don't see it all. But in my limitation, I know who to go to. And that's where he finds his true rest. So we see God's character shine through. We see man's situation being acknowledged but we also have to understand this true rest that is being expressed here. That's what he calls himself to. He calls himself in verse 7, Return, O my soul, to your rest. He calls himself. Say, there is a rest. We could spend gobs of time thinking about this rest, whether it's the pattern that was established in the creation of God resting on the seventh day, whether it was the pattern that he gave to the people of Israel of resting on the Sabbath day and keeping it holy, whether it's the the pattern of rest that we read in Hebrews uh, of saying God has yet for his people a Sabbath rest in his presence for all of eternity. This idea of rest is, is throughout Scripture and it points us to what Jesus says. When he looked out in the crowds and he had compassion on them and he said, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is the God who welcomes us in to give us a rest from the weariness of our very souls, the weariness of the, the, the sorrow and the uh, anxiousness, that anguish that we have in this life. 
This is the promise that God gives throughout all of the scripture. This is the promise that the, the prodigal father, in, in the parable of the prodigal father, welcoming the son back who had returned to him. This rest of return to the father. If you are running from the Lord this morning, return. Call out to your own soul and say, return to your rest, O oh, my soul. Return to where rest really can be found. This is the bell that must be rung long and loud and often to ourselves in a fallen world, to the world around us that is in need of the gospel. This is what we celebrate as we come to the Lord's Supper. That it is God who offers us rest. The Lord's Supper isn't a work that we perform. It's entering into the rest of what God has done for us on our behalf through Christ Jesus. It's an offer to be joined with him in heavenly places by the Holy Spirit joining us together with him and all of God's people together. Now, this message of rest can only be found in the people of God. It can only be found where the gospel is proclaimed. And so we need to be about proclaiming the gospel. This, this idea of rest is, um, is an offer. It speaks of God's grace to those who see the fertility of their own efforts. Saying, I am trying to do all this stuff and I'm trying to fight the, all these things in this world to, to come up with something better. It would include those participants in abortion for some greater lifestyle. It would include people that are mutilating uh, uh, and participating in mutilation of their own bodies in the name of identity. It would include those that are trusting in, in a human government to solve all of our problems and thinking that God will only do something if we help ourselves. It is trusting not in, in God, but in, in man. It is filling our minds with knowledge about God, but missing God himself, as the Pharisees did. This is the fertility of our own efforts. And this is the call to all of us to find rest in Christ. This is the rest that we experience as we celebrate, as we approach the Lord's Supper this morning. Now I said, don't get too anxious because we're spending most of the time, in fact, we're spending the vast majority of time on the first half of this psalm because the second half is really the application. This is what the psalmist does, the life of response. So very quickly for us, there are two points that the psalmist really highlights for us of how are we then to respond? What is our life supposed to look like? It's supposed to be a life of response. What has God done? He has rescued me. Verse 1, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. He asked himself another question in verse 12. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits for me? Now that God has done this, what can I do? Now, ultimately, what we see is the psalmist can't do anything. There is nothing that the Lord needs that he can receive on our behalf that, he, that would somehow uh, match what God has given us in the work of Christ on the cross. And so what do we do? Well, we accept the Lord's work. What you'll notice here in, in this passage is that this ap these points of application are actually repeated. Uh, the psalmist repeats himself here. For he says uh, in verse 13, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. And then in verse 17, he said, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Both of these, the lifting up of the cup and the sacrifice of thanksgiving, are not giving something that God lacks. The sacrificial system was not because God lacked something. It was for the people of Israel to know who God is. And so the psalmist says, what can I do? I can, I can accept what the Lord has done. I can acknowledge it. I can rejoice in it. I can revel in it. I can celebrate what God and God alone can do and has done. The best response 
to God's gracious work of salvation is to take hold of even more of him. It's not an instance where we, we take God and we have to give something back. It's we take God and take more. That's what the Apostle Paul, I believe, is, is getting at in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Lift up the cup of salvation. Drink deeply of what God has done, accepting what he and he alone can do. Call on the name of the Lord. Four times in this psalm, the psalmist says, I will call on the name of the Lord. But secondly, act in obedience. Again, he repeats this. In verse 14, he says, I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. And in verse 18, he says, I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. The psalmist is saying, I will make known the glories of God, not just on paper, that I'm going to sing a song to God in, in my private prayer closet. I am going to proclaim what God has done to everybody who will listen, the first and the foremost of that is the people of God. Now, now notice that that might not be as, as evangelical as maybe what we would think. We would say, hey, you know what? Talk about what God has done. Work that into how the gospel is proclaimed. Tell your neighbor, hey, God just rescued me from whatever it was, this near miss of a car accident. Let me tell you about how Jesus is even better than that. And that's, that's appropriate. That, that's good. We should be talking in that kind of language. But even better is that we would come to the worship of God, corporate worship. We would spend time with other brothers and sisters in Christ, and we would revel in the truth of what God has done. When was the last time that following a communion service, you smiled at a brother or sister in Christ and said, isn't God good to give us what we don't deserve? Maybe even be more specific than that. But act in obedience. That's what, that's what he's saying. The vows that I have, it's an opportunity to declare God's good work and my life obedience to God. Not because I'm earning something, but because it's a reflection of what God has done in me and through me. I am full of gratitude for what God has done, and that works out in my life. Question one more time for you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Why do you love? Do you have a reason? Do you know what God has done through Christ Jesus? Is that why you love God? Do you love God because he first loved you and gave up Christ as an atoning sacrifice on your behalf? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and we ask your blessing on your word that you would transform us by meditating on it, that you would give us your grace and more of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.